Hello, everybody. I'm really glad and really happy to so that you are with us. Today we are sharing our workshop entitled PEMS, RSD and Emissions Models. And we have a very nice group of people here. People from Chile, from Ecuador, from Brazil, from Australia and from England. And the idea is that we can share our thoughts about uh, the topics about PEMS and emissions models and RSD, these tools that help us to measure the emissions and also to incorporate these measurements into models. But this is, this is like a kaleidoscope. This is like one view because uh, when we measure emissions, we, have, we are focusing that we have to do the better, right? Then we input these em measurements and then we can create emissions models. And then there are air quality models. And then we have, we are cr creating like a circle. And the idea is that we have few time, but the idea is that we can share our thoughts and share how we can see um, a pathway, how we can bring some, some how, how we can be in the common vision and how, what's the pathway that you see in the, in the future. So we're starting now with no more delays with Professor Edmison Freitas. Um, maybe you can introduce yourself um, if it's that's okay for you. Uh, after you. I'll share my screen and I will talk about myself when I start presenting, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. See my screen? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio, for the invitation to be here with all uh, our uh, uh, colleagues from the uh, people that work with emissions, modeling, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, uh, my name is Edmilson Freitas. Uh, I'm a professor at the Institute of Astronomy, Geophysics, and Atmospheric Science from the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, my work is most dedicated to the uh, surface atmosphere interactions and uh, apply the application of models to this interaction. And uh, in this matter, we have a pollution, uh, most due to the large number of activities that we have uh, in the surface and as a consequence uh, of our movement in the surface, uh, we have this uh, problem of the air pollution. So I've been working with numerical modeling for almost 25 years. Uh, and one of my, my fields of interest is the, the air pollution. So uh, in this presentation, I, I will try to uh, attend a, a request from Sergio that is uh, try to connect the different uh, applications of numerical modeling uh, for this specific case, uh, a specific case that is the modeling of air pollution. So uh, the, the title of the presentation and uh, try to, to, to bring this link as a bridge among different models uh, to represent uh, air quality everywhere. So the motivation for, for this is that air pollution affects around 5 million people globally. Uh, specifically here in Brazil, we have lots of different sources of air pollution, but the large cities suffer from emissions, from, especially from the vehicular fleet. Most significant sources are, are vehicular. Uh, and although we had a, a large improvement in air quality in the last decades, uh, we still have some problems, especially due to high concentrations of ozone and particulate matter that most of the time they uh, trespass the, the 
WMO uh, standards. So it constitutes a health problem. Uh, one of the characteristics that is really important when we are, talk we are talking about air pollution is that pol pollution can be transported through long distances. For example, we have this uh, very old simulation from my colleague Saulo Freitas showing that biomass burning the tropical region in, in South America can be transported to, through a long distance, including uh, the south of Brazil when it goes away, uh, reaching sometimes the Africa continent. So uh, it can travel to long distance. Uh, this is an example we have in 2019 when we had, uh, during the afternoon, the, the sky was dark, uh, full of particles uh, coming from the biomass burning from the central Brazil, as you can see here over the Amazon region in this satellite picture. Uh, the Amazon and central Brazil over the Cerrado, savanna, the Brazilian savanna, uh, lots of fires and uh, all this pollution was brought to Brazil, uh, to southeast of Brazil uh, during the afternoon. Uh, this is another old result showing that not only large-scale circulations can transport uh, uh, air pollution, but local circulations, massive-scale circulations also can transport air pollution through long distance. This is an example showing that the sea breeze in the coasts of Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, can transport the, the pollution produced in the uh, metropolitan area of Sao Paulo to uh, long distance. Uh, as far as 200 kilometers or sometimes even even for, uh, further than 200 kilometers. So it's a, a problem that uh, it's not concentrated only in the place that you are emitting the pollution, but you can send it, this pollution far away from the sources. Uh, the, the way that we monitor the, the air pollution is mostly based on surface measurements and also uh, some measurement from, from satellite, but uh, most of the stations that have uh, the, the more, most important pollutants are located at the surface. We can use these monitoring stations uh, as an input for the, the numerical models. And this starts not only with the measurements that we have uh, at the surface uh, at a certain period, but you need the observations to uh, for the, the emission models as well uh, to determine, for example, the emission factors. Uh, the modeling will depend, strongly depend on the, the emissions. It's the first step that you have to adopt to, to start your model. Uh, and these emissions are dependent on many experiments, field experiments, for example, uh, you can have tunnel measurements trying to de define the emission factors for uh, emission models. But you can also have measurements inside laboratories, for example, uh, for measurements in the engines of uh, heavy duty vehicles, motorcycles, light duty vehicles, and all the types of vehicles that you have in your location. Uh, so this information will provide data, the necessary data for the emission models. And you have also the necessity to have the traffic modeling in order to get these emission factors and other information, put this information along the roads, along the, the streets and, and highways, and transport this uh, information to the model grid uh, in the resolution that you are able to do your uh, air quality forecast or diagnosis. So this is the process, and when you do that, you can have something like this. This is an example showing the CO emissions uh, in the southeast of Brazil. Sao Paulo is here in the center, and you have the uh, distribution of the emissions along the day uh, covering a 24 hours period. The result of this emission will be applied in a model that has uh, chemical reactions, and all the atmospheric processes inside of it. And the result will, will be something like this. Uh, you have, in this case, the ozone concentrations for uh, here. It's a period in January uh, when we have lots of 
high episodes of ozone. And one thing that we can see here is, again, the fact that the, the pollution uh, can be transported to long distances. Uh, think about that. Uh, we, we have some uh, ways of analyzing not only the, the places that uh, we are having these emissions, but we can analyze the air quality far away from the, the, the sources, as the model shows us uh, high concentrations in uh, remote places. So we deployed a mobile uh, laboratory to measure measure all, uh, lots of different pollutants in a, in a place which is 200 kilometers far away from Sao Paulo, uh, in the northwest of Sao Paulo, and uh, try to understand the, the behavior of some pollutants over there. The, the location is called Botucatu. It's a city uh, which is uh, showed here in, in this satellite picture. The metropolitan area of Sao Paulo is here. And what we were trying to do was uh, to measure how the pollution emitted here in Sao Paulo could affect this location uh, a little bit far from, from the urban center. And we had uh, different uh, interesting results. Uh, in this picture here, we can see in black the ozone concentrations, the mean ozone concentrations uh, for Botucatu. In comparison with Ibirapuera, which is one of the stations here in Sao Paulo that we had the, the most number of uh, vi uh, air quality violations in Sao Paulo. And one thing that we can see here is that uh, although we are in a countryside of the, the Brazil, uh, of Brazil uh, the levels of ozone over there is even worse than uh, the ones that we see in the urban area. So uh, the explanation for that is mostly uh, showing this picture when, uh, where we can see that uh, although we don't have many sources of pollutants over there, we have the transport uh, uh, by the atmosphere. So uh, the whole process is very complex and involves this uh, several steps that I just showed you. So, uh, it's just a start for uh, our discussion here today, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Mesa, for your presentation. We have uh, one minute for question. Is, is there any question here? No? So we can go with Robin. Thank you for your presentation again, and thank you for being here, Robin. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to share my uh, presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes. yes. All right, well, it's great to speak uh, at this workshop and, uh, and meet my uh, South American colleagues. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, linking measurements to models and to ensure that we have useful models. Um, and I always, or not always, I often start with this, uh, this little slide and it may be a depressing statement to some of us, um, but it's interesting to, to know why he says this. Um, he said this, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, because all models are a simplification of reality. And I would say this is particularly so for vehicle missions. They are complex and highly variable in time and space. It's therefore important to assess the, the quality of the model, um, as well as providing information on uncertainty. Uh, and importantly, as I will show today, uh, consider the local situation. And with local, I mean, uh, for instance, uh, country or region specific uh, uh, situation. Uh, but first, uh, let's have a look at some uh, useful uh, model applications, and, and we'll start with two examples. Uh, the first one is um, uh, is some work we did a while ago for the CBD in Adelaide. Uh, this was the Ameson model. Uh, it's a microscopic uh, transport model that uh, simulates uh, uh, speed time profiles of vehicles. Uh, it gives you uh, speed uh, value for each second for each vehicle in the network. Uh, we combine it with the uh, energy-based uh, P-delta-P model, which I will talk about a bit more 
a lighter. And this generates a mission prediction for each second of driving. And of course, that's highly detailed. And it can be used for uh, impact assessments like hotspot analysis, uh, looking at congestion impacts and uh, assess the impacts of traffic measures like uh, uh, whether you should be looking at a signal or, uh, or a roundabout situation. Um, I've added the uh, relevant uh, uh, references at the bottom left uh, for people that would like to look further into this. Um, another example is uh, for a slightly larger road network, more strategic level. Uh, this is uh, a network in the Netherlands when I was working there in Amsterdam. Um, you can see there's, there's many more links or road links in there, uh, slightly larger time periods. And in this case, we used uh, Copert and, and Versa Plus, which is not a model, but Copert uh, is an average speed model um, that uh, expresses emissions uh, as a function of average speed in grams per kilometer. And they're quite easy to combine. Uh, and again, you can look at hotspot analysis, scenario modeling, or looking at total emission loads as one of the applications. So those models are quite useful, um, but are they also appropriate? So we looked into this uh, in Australia. Uh, and as we all know, the US and European uh, vehicle mo emission models are uh, uh, relatively well funded, uh, developed, and also maintained. Um, the question is, are they appropriate for local use, in this case, Australia? So we we started with comparing our measurements with predictions from uh, different models, and we found that the prediction errors were uh, quite substantial, up to a factor of 20. And it's not surprising because um, we have significant differences in the, in the fleet mix, uh, which I will talk to a little bit more. Uh, we have different fuel quality standards. Uh, the climate is uh, wide ranging, it's a big country. Um, we have lagging emission legislation. We don't have any uh, inspection and maintenance or PTI programs in place here. Uh, there might also be slight differences in driving behavior, and there might be more reasons for the differences. Um, so the other option is to develop your own model or to calibrate overseas models. But what you need for that is uh, a significant uh, amount of emission measurements. Uh, and at the time, this was 2013, uh, we worked with our European colleague, colleagues and we, we had lots of uh, data to work with. Uh, we had thousands of uh, laboratory emission tests. And the important thing was that they were um, uh, done over real world cycles that were developed in Australia as well. And we also had a large amount of evaporative emission tests, which is important for your uh, evaporative emission uh, algorithm calibration. So we basically ended up uh, developing two new vehicle emission models. Um, together, they sort of make up a modeling framework, which you can apply different scales, which is COPERT Australia is very similar to COPERT, but uh, it has some differences. And then P-Delta-P, which is uh, 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 similar to FEM in a way, uh, which is used in Europe, or or MOVES, which has different capabilities, um, but uh, it's basically an energy-based high-resolution model. And to quickly uh, unpack that a bit more, uh, COPERT, I think we, most of you would be aware uh, or, or know about, is an average speed model. Uh, you can see on the right, uh, the red line, it's basically a grams per kilometer uh, functionality in there, but it does estimate the whole range of uh, mission types and uh, typically a large range of, uh, of air pollutants and for a wide range of vehicle classes. Um, it's normally applied at road level uh, or you can use it to, to develop uh, national motor vehicle emission metrics. In contrast, uh, P delta P is a, is a modal model which gives you one hertz predictions in grams per second. It's uh, a physical statistical model which means that it, uh, it uses uh, engine power and the change in engine power and then applies statistical modeling to, to make the best fit. You can see an example on the right where you have um, emission rates uh, expressed in grams per second. Um, and this is normally applied at a higher level of detail like roads or intersections, um, but it can also be used for tunnels, for example, or, uh, or ITS assessments among different things. Now, one of the main things, one of the main changes we did in COPET Australia versus COPET is to redefine the vehicle classification. And vehicle, fl uh, vehicle fl fleet classification is very important. Um, in Australia, we are more like a US fleet with uh, uh, lots of SUVs and vehicles having large engines, which you can see in the plot. So, for example, we added SUVs as a whole new category, uh, but we also redefined the engine capacity ranges used in COPET and so made them larger. 
And I just want to say something about fleet models. Um, they are very important and, and maybe even a bit underrated in the whole emission modeling uh, uh, scheme. Um, but importantly, there is a discrepancy here. Um, when you look at transport models, for example, or traffic data, you often have um, traffic information for only a few vehicle classes, for example, light duties and heavy duty vehicles. Whereas you look at vehicle emission models, those models are typically um, uh, modeling at a high level of detail for the vehicle classification. And that is required to, uh, to take into account the large difference in emissions uh, between the different technologies uh, and vehicle types. So what you need is to link the two, and that's normally done with a fleet model. It estimates the proportion of total travel for each individual vehicle class, and it combines a whole range of, uh, of, of data sets uh, and mathematical, mathematical relationships. So you can see on the right here, uh, things like population, the growth rate of the population, scrappage rate, and usage rates, which are typically uh, uh, expressed in age mileage relationships. And you can get a very uh, detailed simulation of, um, uh, of the fleet turnover. So the, the model we've developed in Australia models 1240 vehicle classes and is very detailed in this respect. Um, Validation and maintenance of vehicle emission models obviously is very important. Like I said, you need to make sure that uh, the models have uh, a certain level of accuracy uh, for them to actually be useful. Um, and there's a whole range of, uh, of measurement method methods uh, and all have their strengths and weaknesses. So the best approach is really to use different methods. And we've done just that. So we started with a tunnel study, uh, then we used, uh, we looked into remote sensing and on-road air quality monitoring. And we're currently doing a PEMS study. And I will quickly uh, mention some points about those. So tunnel studies are great for fleet level validation. Um, you can actually derive emission factors at a high level, like light duty, heavy duty vehicles. Uh, and that, but you have to take into account uh, uh, internal airflow and road gradient inside the tunnel. So we did uh, do this for Copic Australia and P-Delta-P, and we found that the prediction errors are uh, within 20% for PM and within 40% for NOx and CO. When you look at on-road air quality, um, that's another very useful way of looking at your emissions. It doesn't give you directly uh, emission factors, although it can be done with, uh, in this case, where you have uh, two air quality monitors at both road sites and you take into account wind speed and flux. <clears throat> but the main outcome here for us was that we uh, had a confirmation of the, of the tunnel study results where our VOC speciation uh, was way off. Um, and we also found a very different speciation of the hydrocarbons. So we had to conclude that uh, the, the current uh, European-based VFC speciation is not appropriate for the Australian on road fleet and needs to be developed or modified. Remote sensing. Um, yeah, so this is remote sensing is a very powerful tool, as I'm sure that uh, others like Carl will, uh, will talk about more. Um, but we, we tried to take it a little step further by combining lots of instruments, as you can see on the, uh, the photo on the right. Um, for example, by adding a second uh, license plate number camera and look detectors, we were able to increase the capture rate uh, with about 10%. We also used uh, MAC address units to track vehicles in the surrounding network and find, find out where they're coming from. And this is relevant for cold start uh, emission detection. Uh, on top of that, we used uh, thermal cameras to um, uh, thermally profile uh, vehicles, and this is useful to uh, check if a high emitter is, is possibly in cold start mode, uh, because emissions can be elevated because of cold start, not because it's uh, like a high technological failure in the vehicle itself. So we found that about 35% of the high emitters are in cold start mode uh, in this urban area. We also, um, and another, I think, important thing is to correlate different data sets. Uh, like I said, you can look at different types of measurements, but you have to correlate them uh, to be able to understand the differences and to be able to combine and, uh, and compare the results. So we did a dynamometer uh, RSD correlation study where um, we developed a specific uh, drive cycle for RSD comparison, which you can see at the bottom. And we did find a strong uh, weighted correlation. Uh, between the remote sensing and the dynamometer testing for two vehicles. And that's despite the high level of variability in RSD measurements. 
So the conclusion was that RSD should provide robust uh, emissions data for trend analysis studies and as input for regional emission models. But I think it's also important to note that uh, you know emission measurements can be used directly uh, for assessment and issue identification. So we looked at 10 years of remote sensing data uh, that we conducted around Australia. And uh, we did confirm that by that we have four real world NOx performance for uh, diesel vehicles. We're still in Euro 5. I think it's the same case in, in, in Brazil at the moment. And we're looking at uh, adopting Euro 6, which is very delayed. But um, this is an important finding because um, our diesel vehicles are uh, not performing well in NOx. But um, also quite relevantly, um, the UV smoke measurements, which is basically detecting soot, also suggest that uh, the diesel particulate filters are uh, having a problem in, in, a, in a significant percentage of the Euro 5 diesel uh, fleet. Um, and we compared it to some work uh, that was done in the UK and it seemed that we have a larger issue in Australia with filters and whether it's the quality of the filter or anything else, we, we're not entirely sure yet, but uh, the issue seems larger in Australia than in the UK, um, uh, possibly because we don't have an inspection and maintenance program here in place in, in contrast to the UK. And this is again an example of a local effect that you need to account for in your emission factors. Um, PEMS. So we're doing a, we have done a small uh, PEMS program, but it's very comprehensive, and that's I think is a benefit as well. Um, so we looked at cold start, uh, cold start tests uh, for about 88 kilometers long. We included four hot start tests with uh, different uh, time periods in between. Uh, we included extended idling to see what's happening there. We included coast down testing and fuel quality testing. And to give you a small example of some, some of the things we're looking at at the moment is uh, a calibration of engine power prediction uh, parameters with a grid search and error minimization. And this is to account for variability uh, in weather conditions, basically on emissions, um, and to have some flexibility in your emission modeling later on. One of the um, other things is to add critical data and maximizing data use. So we found that uh, the R geocomputation libraries are very useful uh, and very efficient in this respect. Um, and you can see on the right, and this is some pretty recent work we've done, is to uh, estimate road gradient, which is a critical uh, parameter variable um, for modal modeling, and as well as understanding and checking uh, the data itself. Um, I mean, you have a digital elevation model for Sydney in this case, uh, you can overlay that uh, on the route, which is the, the white line, and extract um, elevation that way. Uh, it's very powerful and very useful to do it this way, uh, also in terms of visualization. You can see the little uh, red uh, circle. This is where the tunnel is, um, and this is something that we also did um, because we want to maximize data, maximize data use. Um, we basically looked at the design of the tunnel and uh, extracted the elevation data that way. Uh, one of the other th things of count for is the uh, uh, real effects like GPS signal loss. And we found that about 200 meter uh, after the tunnel exit, we have a uh, accurate signal again, which you need to account for the area in between. Um, Almost done. Um, statistical uh, or actually machine learning statistical learning methods. Um, we're looking into this as well, and it seems to be particularly powerful um, to improve our models, um, specifically random forest, which I think has also been reported in the literature by other researchers. Um, it's very useful for anomaly detection and data quality control. Uh, what I mean with that is that you can fit a model to part of the data set and you can identify areas. Uh, that were, were, which are affected by drift or other issues with the measurement itself. Um, and of course, you can use it directly for emission model improvement, which we're doing at the moment. So uh, in terms of uh, some main conclusions here, uh, vehicle emission models should reflect uh, the lo local situation, is what we have found. So be really careful by adopting overseas models without uh, consideration or calibration. Uh, local fleets models are very important. Um, emission measurement method, there's a range of, range of method that can be used but they have specific pros and cons. Um, it's best to use a range of methods in our experience uh, because they look at different aspects. Uh, combining methods is also very powerful and useful uh, in terms of the information they generate and uh, proper statistical analysis and modeling 
are essential for uh, uh, data quality checking as well as uh, emission model and software development. And um, real-world vehicle emission measurements are also essential for accurate emission estimation and maintaining models and identification of emerging uh, new issues, which can specifically be local. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Robin. I don't know if, it, if there are no questions. Maybe we can have a, 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 a discussion at the end of this meeting. I was uh, receiving some observations that the volume in YouTube is a little bit low. And I asked it to the IT guys for to help to um, to fix that problem, but it seems that uh, this is the, the the software that they're using is, is in the maximum capacity. So uh, I guess that we can follow up. Maybe we can speak a little bit higher. But um, <clears throat> I will later. I will once this meeting is finished. I will get a copy of this of this recording, I will manually fix the volume and then it will upload the game, you know, because that's the, that's the way out that I'm seeing right now. Other case, if you can speak a little bit louder. And thank you, great presentation, Robin. Speak a little bit. Sergio. But, um, <clears throat> I will be... Sergio. Yes. Uh, I think we should record from uh, the Google meeting because later you can change because the, the recording uh, at YouTube will be uh, with low volume too. So no, but I can fix that also. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. yeah, 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 no, no worries. I can, uh, so now if we continue, so now we have, have the lead screw. Dr. Carl Robkins, please go ahead. Right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. And can you see my little mouse floating around the screen? Yeah. Magic, right, good yeah. day everyone. Uh, sorry. Yeah, by, by the way, if you, if, you, if you click Control plus the letter L, your mouse is transforming into a laser. Okay, just that. Control and L. No? Okay, oh, sorry. Hang on, hang on. Oh, no. No, leave it. Not going to worry about it. I'm not getting it. Um, good day, all. Um, my name's Carl Rockins. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Leeds in the UK. Um, like a lot of folks here, I, I work on a range of techniques, um, and I'm mainly interested in how we do, do better in future, how we measure emissions better in future, really. Um, so I was going to talk about EDAR, which is one of the remote sensing techniques. So it's a, it's a measure and method that focuses on measuring the emissions of a passing vehicle. Apologies for those people that work with satellite data and also use the term remote sensing. But unfortunately, in this case, we're talking about a little bit nearer to Earth, um, things that measure distance emissions of a vehicle as they pass by. Robin mentioned them briefly in his talk previously. I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail here. I'm going to talk about one of the tech, I'm going to provide an introduction at the start just to explain what they are for those people who aren't familiar, then talk about one of the techniques in, in particular, what we've done to validate it, what we've done to look at the data that's coming out of it, and then there's some conclusions at the end. Um, happy to share the full range of slides, and there's lots of extra slides stuck in at the end, by the way, for anyone that does want to look at them. Right. Anyone that not talks about remote sensing of vehicle emissions and open path measurement methods is going to be most familiar with the technique, the crossroad techniques. In fact, most people that talk about remote sensing and um, vehicle emission measurements are actually typically referring to a, to a system like this one at the top, which is basically on one side of the road, you have an analyzer, sends a beam of light across the road. On the other side, you have a detector, and then a vehicle drives through, and as it drives through, as the exhaust plume passes through the beam of light, certain chemicals within the uh, plume are absorb light, and then you detect their concentrations 
by the removal of them from the light beam. There's other configurations of this type of system, for instance, with detector on one side, a mirror box on the other, and then a source on this side again, reflecting backward and forward the light. And that sort of system's been used in more studies than I care to mention. Don Stedman and Gary Bishop were lead workers in there with the feet techniques, but now you'll see commercialized versions of their systems all over the world. And they've been used for, for cars, lorries, there's a locomotive in the US, snowmobile, an aircraft. Basically, anything you can get to move past your beam of light so you can detect the emissions of a passing vehicle, you can collect data from. And the key thing here is when you've got that deployed somewhere, you can catch lots of passing vehicles. So you very quickly gain a snapshot of each of the vehicles in the local fleet. It's a nice way to gather data at that high level. Now, in addition to these open path systems, where you're sending light beam across the road, there's some down facing techniques. And that's one of the ones I'm going to talk about today is called EDAR. Um, they hold a unit above the road and then detect emissions of vehicles pass under them. However, in addition, there's also other techniques where they're looking at active sampling. So you'll actually pump a large volume of air from either above or below the road as the vehicle's passing by. And then you'll capture pl plume information that way. The trade-off here is that you're doing lots of extra work to get a slightly less sensitive signal because you're pulling that air in and slightly lower resolution signal in terms of time. But the glory is that you can use methods that aren't optical. So you can use some of the nice particle counters, the condensation counters, the ionization centers, um, detectors that allow you to look at very small particles that are typically in exhaust pipes. So onto the technique I'm talking about. This is EDAR. Um, I have a camera above the road, sends a laser beam down across the road, and it flicks backward and forward across the road you know, in what they often call a, a broom sweeping action. Um, along On the bottom of the road there, there's a reflector strip that reflects the light back up to the camera. And this is a picture of it deployed in London. This is at Marlebone Road. Um, for any of those that's done the tourist trail, Madame Tussauds is across the road there, the, one of the big Euros, um, tourist attractions in the UK. And the section of road we're looking at here in this case is a bus and taxi lane. Um, so London taxi there, somewhere in the distance there'll be some buses. Um, and there's my detector, there's my reflector strip. That's what I'm measuring. That's the footprint of data I collect. Now, one of the key advantages here when you're looking across the road, sending a single beam backwards and forwards, you get a concentration measure. What you get when you look down on a road is actually a picture of the passing vehicle and then some information about the shape of the plumes. So for instance, with these pictures here, the vehicle they're looking at actually is a twin exhaust system. So you can see there and there, two exhaust plumes. It's a really nice way of gathering lots of extra information. It's not cheap, I'm very sorry. But it's, I say it's a nice way to gather lots of extra information about the passing vehicle. For instance, we've got some nice pictures showing a vehicle with the plume actually coming out down the side of the vehicle. And in that case, it was a cracked exhaust pipe on the vehicle. So there's lots of interesting data you can gather with these systems. But the most key important factor is that they are deployed at the roadside, measuring a vehicle as they go by. So you deploy them somewhere with lots of flows of traffic, lots of vehicles under load, you'll collect lots of data for lots of vehicles. Now, as part of our work deploying that system, one of our first um, projects in the UK was to actually look at how well it worked. Using something for real, the manufacturer is always going to tell you something is wonderful. However, with this system, we wanted to actually start to quantify how well it worked. So we did a couple of real world evaluations. And this, again, maybe ties into something Robin was talking about before me with that fact that it's really important to look at how you can use these techniques together. So for instance, this is a PEMS vehicle measuring the emissions of its, and its own exhaust pipe. We did a series of drive-bys driving that through the beam um, profile of the EDAR collecting data. And this set of examples here are plots from the data. We had to do a little bit of work first of all to work out how, how to actually detect when the vehicle was passing through. Also, which were the good measurements? Because if the vehicle jerks as it's going through, it's very hard to know exactly which, which instant 
of the exhaust plume you are measuring with that single measurement coming out of a system like EDAR or any of the remote sensing systems. So several sets of data there from PEMS vehicles versus the EDAR. And then afterwards we did some work with Car Chaser, which some might be less familiar to people. Basically in this instance, you measured the emissions from a point on the front of your car and you're measuring the vehicles you're following. So you're looking, rather than looking at the plume of your own vehicle, you're looking at the vehicle ahead of you's plume. And in th this case, the advantage is you can follow lots of different vehicles through. So rather than just have lots of data for this one vehicle multiple times, we can look at several different vehicles over time. So here we've got a plot of data coming out of the car chaser work showing different types of vehicles ranging from several cars through to some HGVs at the top end here, um, the red and the purple line here. So we can show that not only is it giving us a nice measurement for a single vehicle, it's giving us a nice measurement for a range of vehicles. So with that sort of ba baseline work in terms of validation, we move on to some of the data we've collected with it. Um, now, firstly, quick note for everyone. This data is quoted in grams per kilometer. The usual way to quote something like remote sensing work is usually in a ratio to CO2. And that's what I'd recommend doing anyway. The reason this is quoting grams per, grams per kilometer is that's what the client wanted on this project. So in the supporting information, there's the corrections we applied to get from the standard measurement from that type of system into this type of measurement. But even so, this shows some really nice information. Firstly, you've got for a local car fleet, you've got some information on the vehicle, how much they're emitting, how the cars are emitting relative to the buses, relative to the HGVs. If you link the data from the number plate recognition system, telling you the number plate of the vehicle, to the local database of uh, uh, license plate records, you can then get in information about what fuel the car's running on, what Euro class it's in, and so on. And you can actually start to build up this really nice picture of what's going on in your fleet. And this is that information that feeds in to the emission models. These are the emission factors that go right in at the front end. So as you build the fleet up, this is the type of data you, you're looking to collect and validate. Now, quick note here, there's loads of information here. Every time you look at these things, you'll spot something else that's interesting. And the thing I'm gonna point out here is for a lot of these vehicle classes that were diesel vehicles, so the diesel cars, the taxis, which were all predominantly diesel in the UK, for the buses, for the lorries, for the vans, there's actually not a lot of difference within the error bars between the Euro 1, um, between the later Euro models, so Euro 3, Euro 4, Euro 5, suggesting that on the road in the real world, we weren't actually delivering many benefits going through these Euros until we hit Euro 6. And all of a sudden you start to see some improvements in the actual emission characteristics of those vehicles. So post diesel gate, that's what we got out of it. We saw a direct improvement of some of our vehicle classes at that time. However, the next thing I'm going to point to is this little purple bar that you see here that's typically often the highest one. They're the vehicles that aren't in the database of number plates. So they're vehicles that aren't registered to be on the road in the UK. Um, some of them are vehicles that are officially um, not recognized by data. Some of them have faulty number plates. Some, some of them, for whatever reason, aren't taxed. And among these, you'll see that repeatedly, they tend to be some of the highest emitting vehicles on the roads. So as I say, every time you look at this type of data, you'll see more information, more things, more messaging, more to learn. However, before we think too much about that, I'd also like to point the caveats out. Um, when I collect remote sensing data, I'm typically deploying that somewhere I'm going to see lots of vehicles, somewhere I'm going to see lots of vehicles under load because I'd like lots of bangs for me bucks. It's an expensive technique, costs a lot of money. Rogan will tell you this as well. They're not cheap. Um, and when they're deployed in the field, you typically deploy them somewhere where the vehicles are under high load to get a nice big plume. This means you're typically deploying them in a situation like the one here where you've got a high speed and a high flow in your measurements. Um, this is data capture rate along the bottom. So we look, so here we've got nice data capture rates up in the 90s. We've got loads of data capture there. Some of the other conditions, the lower speed uh, or the lower flow, for instance, we get much lower capture rates. Um, they're relatively obvious 
because in that instance, with a low speed and low, um, sorry, we're, oh, that one. with a low speed and a low flow, there's not many vehicles going by, so you don't see many to count. But over here, we have the lower speed, higher flow. So that's when you're starting to get congested. And there again, we don't see many emission measurements. Firstly, because we're not normally deploying in situations where that happens. But when we do, we don't get a decent spacing between the vehicles to actually measure what happens after the vehicle, to see a nice separate plume for vehicle one before vehicle two blocks the beam. So this is a technique that tends to ignore some of the conditions where some of the highest emissions happen. So deceleration, idling, congestion, all of these things this technique is relatively blind to. So if I move on, this has an effect on the data we're looking at. For instance, here I've showed you a distribution of, from a remote sensing system, the per one, and it's very different from the distribution we get from lots of the drive cycles that are used in testing. They all predominantly sit around one, these are much higher. So here's my on-road emissions measurements. Here are my measurements by Euro class. There's the class standard line, and you can see I'm seeing lots of vehicles that are emitting much higher, much higher rates than is reported based on the legislative standard, or to be expected on a legislative standard. Um, however, what we need to look at here is that part of the reason for that is I'm only deploying under the high load sections of the journey. I'm not getting the low load sections of the journey. If I readjust for that, I see I still see high emissions. They're still between one and four times higher than what we see from the dyno test, but they're much less scary than the type of things that were generating headlines a few years ago when people first started looking at some of this data and comparing to the to the emission standard measurements. So needs to have careful handling. Um, however, that said, one of the things it's really nice at doing, or potentially really nice at doing, is spotting the bad vehicles in the fleet. So if you have one bad vehicle in the fleet, quite often it's it can be a large percentage of the emissions. So we typically see cases where 20% of the fleet are responsible for 80% of the emissions. Now, some of that, as Robin's already mentioned, is cold starts, but also some of that is down to bad vehicles. So tampered with vehicles or incorrectly maintained vehicles. And the chance that we'd actually be able to pick those vehicles off the road is one of our truly strong cases for actually really bringing down the emission levels really quickly. So. That's really enough from me. I'm just going to summarize by saying that these type of techniques will give you a lot of data. It needs to be handled with care because there are distort potentials to distort it. If you don't take into account the fact that it's measured under relatively high load, but as a surveillance tool, it has an excellent potential to be a gatekeeper technology for something like a low emission zone to, introduce, to generate emission inventory data. And I'll stop there with that and say thank you for your time. Thank you, Carl. Really uh, impressive presentation. Lots of interesting, interesting findings, and the dieselgate effect was like the, it's like the emission factors of dieselgate. Very really interesting. Now we would like to introduce Dr. Mauricio Oses. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um... I hope you are looking at my presentation now. Um, <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, my presentation is uh, is quite short, and I'm, I I want to tell you what we are doing in Chile. I'm not showing much uh, final results because there is a second presentation today that is uh, given by Kevin Asoa, and so I would mostly uh, mainly uh, focus on the what we are doing and some of the challenges we are facing uh, using PEMS in Chile with little money and difficult, some difficulties we have been having in the last year because we have the equipment, but we cannot test the, uh, because of the, the sanitary conditions. But anyway, the, the, well, these pictures here are pictures from the, from the internet, just comparing the dynamometer testing with the on road, road testing. testing. And these, these two, two pictures, pictures are real from, from our uh, testing we have been doing in Chile. Uh, this was uh, last year. 
and we were testing a gasoline passenger car and also a diesel SUV. And all the equipment you see at the back of the cars are the equipment we have been buying with a project in the last two years. So what we are using right now is a um, typical PEMS. In this case, you, you are looking at the very old version of the Semtec units. Uh, hopefully, we will have the, one of the new versions if we can get the money to get those. So in the, in, in the meantime, we are using this unit that uh, is already like a 12 years old. It's in a very bad condition, but it's still measuring. And the, the prices we, are, we have been receiving from quotation from Semtec, Horiba, and ABL are between $150,000 and even to $600,000 if you want to buy the whole equipment. Another option we tested is the, this is small mini pumps. It's 40 kilo, kilo dollars and is uh, able to measure not only gases, but also particle mass and particle number. So it's a very nice piece of unit, but of course the, the quality of the data is lower than the, the real PEMS unit, but still good to know that the, we tested, we, we, were, we were very satisfied with it. And we are also planning to, to continue using this equipment that it was, uh, we use it only for one month because we participated in the cannonball that this, uh, the company, 3D ATX, was, uh, is organizing and they invited us to participate and we received this equipment for one month. <clears throat> Some of the challenges we are facing right now is that we want to use different kind of uh, particle matter equipments. In this case, you are looking at one of them. We, we are testing three different kinds. This is, in particular, this is the Pegasus unit, which is uh, able to measure particle mass and particle number. And it also has a very nice piece of equipment, which is the air conditioning for, for the air entering the, the system. And this is one of the problems we have been facing right now, is the, the quality of the, the water vapor coming into the system and sometimes uh, we go out for a testing and we get no data because the, the, we have problems with the, with the air coming into the system and we are in the process of resolving this, these problems and I wanted to, to point out this in this conversation but maybe some of the guys here in the, in the meeting they have some experience and can give us some, some good advice on how, how we can avoid, avoid these problems. Another problem we are having is the, the dilution and also the diluters. Some equipment are, are coming with their own diluting system, but we uh, designed and constructed our own equipment, which you can see here in the picture. And using this diluter, we were able to measure with the Pegasus and also with other two uh, different equipment and testing this in, on the road. And as you can see here, the this was we, we were testing maybe three or four months ago when the sanitary conditions were uh, less complicated than today. Today we cannot do this. So that's for the particle matter. And after getting all this data, we are putting all the data into a program, in this case is uh, with, with Python, trying to put all the data from the different cars we are testing, later looking at the, 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 the trip with it, and also the different speeds from the GPS we also designed especially for, for this system. And then we had the problem of data alignment. We need to, to put together different analyzers, different signals, or coming from with different uh, time resolutions. And so the program is trying to put everything in one line. So we, we are making sure the GPS, the different gases, the different particles are all uh, starting at the same point. And one of the problems we are looking at here is, is not only uh, looking at the, defining the beginning of the data, but also is that, for example, if we are testing for 40 minutes, we have other delays in between. So we are trying to make uh, some kind of a data analysis that can detect this this uh, 
this uh, problems on the, on, on, on the whole test and try to correct them. If we are doing a good uh, analysis of the data, we are getting all the emissions and also emission factors. And then and finally, we are looking at the binning of BSP or the vehicle specific power, which is the, the theory we have been using for several years and we are also trying to use in our, in our testing right now. And after having uh, all the emission factors and having good vehicle activity, our goal is to have a, a good uh, um, map of emissions in the whole of Chile. And also in Colombia, we're doing the same, exactly what I, I, I told you, we're doing the same exactly in Colombia. So if, if we have good data, we can also have a good model of emissions. So far, this model you are looking at here is uh, using copper emission factors, but we would like to do more testing with the PAMs. So if we can have our own emission factors will be great. And also the activity is a model from traffic counts, which are historical traffic counts. And so we are trying to use that historical data, trying to, to see what is happening right now in the uh, actual time or also in the future. So I told you it was, a, it was going to be a short uh, presentation. This is the, my, my final slide, but what we are trying to do next, according to what I just uh, explained to you, we are trying to obtain emission factors for different types of vehicles with, with PEMS equipment. But more important than that, we are trying to support the government because uh, Chile is uh, implementing the Euro 6 uh, standard, Euro 6B and then Euro 6C, but the government doesn't have the, the capability, the technical capability to use uh, on road testing. So we as a, from the academy, from the universities, we're trying to provide this knowledge and trying to, to train the, the people at the government how to get the best equipment in the, in, the, in the market and also how to use it then. In terms of uh, research, we are very interested in particle matter or aerosols really, uh, not only looking at particle mass, but also particle number Black carbon is a, is a big issue in Chile, and we are also trying to get a real emission factors of black car carbon from different kinds of vehicles, and also active, sur active surface as well. Um, moving into vehicle activity, one of the approach we are just starting now is to measure vehicle, uh, vehicle flows in real time with cameras, and these cameras train with uh, machine learning. This is something we were talking with Sergio maybe a year and two years ago, and we're still thinking that this is a, this is a, it's a good idea how to get a real-time data. Also, it's very important, I'm, I'm happy to see here people from, from South America as well, to work to with, together with countries in the region. And our project, the project, this uh, FONDEF with this number here, which is uh, funding all the equipment we are we are using right now uh, will end now in at the end of uh, Ju uh, July, and we have have our final webinar in August 2021. So, if you are interested, we can send you some invitations for for that final webinar. And finally, uh, behind all this data, there is a lot of people. So I just wanted to put a picture here, and this guy here is Kevin, who will be talking to you in a few minutes. Uh, according to the problem. So that's it. And ready for question when, whenever you want, uh, Sergio. And so, sorry for being so, so short, but that, I think it's better that, like that to have more time for, for discussion. It was a really nice presentation. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, maybe some, I, I heard that you have some doubts. Maybe you would like to ask some questions or maybe you we can wait uh, to the end of this of the of this of this of this, of this workshop, what do you think? No, no, I I can wait, and I, I will be happy. To say some of my questions can be answered or commented at the end of the the webinar. Sergio. Well, just perfect. And now it's time for Mr. Rafael. 
Pereira from IPEA. And please, uh, thank you, Rafael, for being here. Okay, guys, can you see my screen? Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so let's start. So uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. My name is Rafael Pereira, and I'm a researcher at IPEA, at the Brazilian Institute for Applied Economic Research. Uh, I'm presenting a work that is we've been developing over the past one year and a half, almost two years now. And it's a collaboration that uh, myself, uh, João Baza, also working at IPEA, uh, we are developing this together with Pedro Andrade, who is also here with us in the session today. Pedro works at the National Institute of Space, Space Research in Brazil. So it's kind of a Brazilian federal government uh, collaboration project. And we are developing a model named GTFS to emiss. So it's a bottom-up model to estimate public transport emissions from GTFS data. So the idea of the project is to create an R package that provides a generalizable method to estimate public transport emissions at high spatial and temporal resolution leveraging on the standard GTFS uh, data format uh, and some additional information on fleet and emission factors. Uh, this will be clear along my presentation. This will also be a very short presentation. So the idea here, uh, for those who are not familiar with GTFS, GTFS stands for Global Transit Feed Specification. Uh, GTFS is basically a global standard format for uh, transport agencies to uh, disclose their public transport information. So we have nowadays over thousands of local transport agencies across the globe uh, that share their public transport data in GTFS format. Uh, this is the standard format of data that is consumed by mobile apps, uh, uh, Google Maps, uh, OpenStreet Planner, and R5, and many other routing engines uh, that we see uh, in the wild. Uh, the, for those who haven't seen how a GTFS looks like, it's basically this. So GTFS ultimately is a bunch of text files. So it's a rela relational database with text files that, br that brings the, a very detailed information with the geolocated timetables of the transport system. So you have some information about the routes, the trips, uh, the calendar, uh, the travel times, frequencies, headways, uh, stops, uh, the geometry of each route, and so on and so forth. So it's all basically a bunch of text file in a relational database. Uh, and GTFS is the main input of the model that we are developing. Basically, when you're, you're using the package the GTFS to this, you only have to input four uh, information. One first is a GTFS feed of the city or the region where you're uh, looking at, uh, and some fleet characteristics of, of the region, uh, including vehicle type, the fuel, the age of the vehicle, and so on. This could be either a detailed table that tells you what type of vehicle is running on each bus route, but it could also be a general table with uh, the overall fleet composition with those characteristics. Let's say 20% of the fleet uh, was, um, uh, is from 2012, 25% uh, of the fleet is from 2015, 10% uh, of the fleet is B-articulated bus of this type, of this category, and so on and so on. So either way, it, it could be a very detailed information or a very general information. This will ultimately, uh, or both options will be, uh, are, are currently available. The user also have to select what pollutants uh, he or she would be interested in estimating. We currently have approximately, I think, 12 uh, different pollutants, but we could expand that list. And, and finally, the person has to select the emission factor uh, that she will be using. Uh, this is, these emission factors are provided within the package and within other R packages, including packages developed by, by Sergio. So for Sao Paulo, we are using the uh, emission factors of CETESB, uh, the European Environmental Agency for European Cities and the, Ameri the United States uh, model using the EMF phase C 2017 model. But we would be really happy to expand the emission factors uh, included in the package to include COPART and some other uh, updates that will be coming out soon. So as you can see, this is a very simple 
uh, very, very simple and very, um, we, don't have, we don't really need to use a lot of uh, data inputs. And what GTFS to emis does is basically this. So you pass a GTFS data set, and under the hood, the first step that the package will do is to convert the GTFS data in that relational uh, table format into something that is very familiar to most of us, which is a GPS-like data table. So this will be done by another package that we developed called GTFS to GPS. And uh, this is already available on GitHub. Um, and the package was intended to be a, a, a stepping stone to the emission model that we're developing. But we see that we already have 10,000 downloads. So a lot of people in the community are finding this package useful for other stuff. But basically, the main purpose of this package is to do one and one simple thing, to convert a GTFS data into a table that looks like a GPS uh, data. So you can have the space-time traject trajectories of every vehicle at a very high spatial and temporal resolution. And then you can create this nice map with data visualizations that you see on the right. Once you have a, a data table like this, simulating what would have been the GPS data of the public transport system, what GTFS to emis will do is basically to get information of the fleet characteristics that I mentioned and the emission factors and do some calculations to estimate uh, the amount of emissions that being uh, from the tailpipe emissions for, of each single vehicle every for every uh, road segment at every time of the day. So you, you can aggregate this in um, spatial line strings, hexagons, spatial grids uh, across the day, or a space-time cube, if you want. One of the main advantages of, of, of the model that we are developing is because it, it uses so few uh, data inputs that it, it can be relatively easy, easily scalable to other cities. So a very quick example is we have here some estimates of CO2 emissions for Houston, um, PM10 uh, for Sydney, Australia. And uh, we won't go into detail of looking and analyzing each of those cities here in my presentation today, but I, I believe for those of you who are familiar with the cities, you can almost immediately look at the maps and identify what are the main pub, uh, public transport corridors or, or city center in these respective cities. We also built um, some estimates for uh, Rome in Italy and <clears throat> uh, apologies for Curitiba in Brazil. Specifically for Curitiba, for our Brazilian colleagues who are watching us today, you can immediately identify in the map the BRT corridors that cross the city. And that's what, where you have uh, the largest uh, public transport emission levels uh, in, in absolute terms. Obviously, we would need to uh, do some additional estimates in terms of considering how these emission levels are uh, respective to the number of passengers transported in each of those public transport routes. But this is for a second step of the project. So the idea of this, uh, that we are very excited about this project to, to some extent because it has a few advantages, but it, it, do, it does have a few caveats that we should uh, remember as well. So in terms of advantages, it's, it's quite important to emphasize that it, it, it has very uh, little data requirements. So once you have GTFS and a very simple fleet profile of the city, you can already run some rough estimates of, of, of the region. Uh, because of GTFS is a standard format that is um, used, used ubiquitously, ubiquitous, ubiquitously uh, across many cities in the world, this makes the, the method relatively easy to replicate to other cities in the world. The method is very also, it's also very flexible. You can use it to estimate uh, the emissions of a, one specific bus route or one specific vehicle um, or part of the city or to the whole transport system at the same time. And it's relatively fast in terms of computation time, given that we are using a very high spatial and temporal resolution. Uh, thanks to uh, data table and some amazing uh, software uh, uh, pa and, and packages that we have in the ARC community. Uh, we do have some caveats, though, that, uh, that we should emphasize. One is that we, we still don't have, we, we don't cover rail modes. So because we haven't found yet any 
information on emission factors for rail modes, we cannot, we still cannot have uh, estimates of emissions for subways, uh, rails, uh, trains, light rail systems, and so on. So if any of you guys know where to find those emission factors, or if you're interested in using portable emission um, devices to monitor and measure the level of emission within the boundaries of uh, rail transport modes, we will be very happy to hear from you. Uh, Another very important thing, we are only looking at uh, tailpipe emissions. We are not considering the whole, the full life cycle of emissions uh, in the system. We are currently not taking into account the effect of the terrain elevation or uh, the load of passengers has or, or could have on the vehicle's emissions, but this is a very important thing that Robin mentioned before. Um, and also, we are currently not taking into account idle uh, vehicles and congestion facts. So we do we do account for chronic congestion, but for we don't account for um, specific congestion effects that happen might happen one in one or two days, um, so to speak. And in my final slide, uh, Sergio asked us to reflect about, a bit about uh, future research agenda. Uh, one of the things that is the most immediate um, um, task in our research agenda right now is to write a paper during the, an environmental benchmark comparing the transport, public transport emissions across different global cities. This is a paper that we have been developing. It's in progress in collaboration with Robin, with Sergio, with Sonia Ye uh, uh, from Sweden, uh, and a few others. So we are still uh, very much working on this paper. And the idea is to have a benchmark comparison of at least 20 global cities. Um, it would be very interesting to see to what extent the estimates that we get out of our uh, GTFS to a MIS model could be validated or calibrated with GPS data and PEMS data that so many of you guys are collecting. And, and I think it's, I have to say, it's very humbling to watch you guys present you doing all this heavy lifting work of using PEMS to collect emission data at the ground level. Um, uh, finally, we really want to incorporate emission factors of rail modes, uh, the effects of terrain elevation, and ultimately we believe one of the powerful aspects of this kind of method that we are developing is that it makes it very simple and very easy to do scenario analysis, not only to compare cities, but also to estimate the policy, to estimate the impact of different policy scenarios. Let's say you want to electrify 20% of your fleet, or you want to uh, renew 50% of your fleet, uh, what impact those uh, policies would have and how the those impact would be spatially and temporally distributed across the city. And ultimately, the outputs from this model, uh, we would really love to see them uh, at some point be incorporated in future research, where we look at how different socioeconomic groups are more or less exposed to public transport pollutions um, and to reflect better on, on how we think about sustainable and inclusive cities in terms of environmental justice, bringing this environmental justice discussion, discussion into public transport emissions as well. That's all I had to say for today. Sorry, I maybe spoke for too long. No, three minutes. Okay. Thank you, Rafael. Amazing talk, interesting results, and the development of GTFS to GPS, then to GF, uh, GFTS, GFS to <laughs> to MS, you know, it's really, really, really interesting. I, and I'm sure that these tools will be used worldwide, I'm sure. So I also we have some comments at the end, really interesting. But now, uh, get on, Mr. Dr. Samir Mera, uh, He's doctor and professor from university in Ecuador. Please go ahead. And unmute yourself, please. Thank you very much, Sergio. Uh, uh, can you see my presentation now? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So 
Now, yes. Is the full presentation in your, in your screen? Not the full presentation. We can see the PowerPoint, but not the full presentation. Sorry. I have a few problems with my internet connection, I think. No, don't worry, try, try again. Uh, during, when you tried, it was perfect. So now you have to do it again and it will be fun. Yes, okay. Let me share you again uh, to see if it is working. Nope. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Don't worry, take your time. But not so much time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's okay. Yes. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the space, uh, Sergio. Um, my name is Amir Mera. I am working in Ecuador as professor in the University, Technical University of the North, in the Spanish Universidad Técnica del Norte. I was working during my PhD, uh, basically in NOx emissions modeling, uh, and I returned to the university the past year. So most of my results are uh, from my uh, PhD research, and at the end of the presentation, I will talk about some uh, a path that we can take uh, for the Latin American case, I think. Uh, the content of my presentation uh, is about a, a briefly introduction to modeling scales. Then I will talk about the NOx production from vehicles, uh, of course, the tailpipe NOx emissions, and some aspects of a modeling level, a, a microscopic model, modeling level. Well, uh, NOx emissions uh, modeling it presents some challenges. Uh, uh, often the accuracy of NOx emissions models are not so high because NOx emissions are present like peaks. These NOx emission peaks have a, a huge impact in the total NOx emissions. Um, this is reflected like a high nonlinear fashion of the NOx emission peaks over the time. Uh, NOx emissions depends on the working conditions of uh, internal combustion engines and also of the NOx control systems. Um, the modern vehicles have low emission levels, which also uh, increase the complexity for modeling. Uh, another aspect is that cold start conditions, uh, uh, usually the vehicle, uh, the, the systems of the vehicle and the NOx control systems are changing their behavior and uh, usually catalyst do, 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 doesn't work in these conditions. Uh, also, there are weakness of the regulations, which are, is reflected in variability between vehicles and between uh, the different levels of, uh, in the case of European uh, regulation. Okay, um, following to the previous presentations, uh, we have the modeling level. The modeling level is important uh, because uh, a model is an abstraction of the reality. And we have a, a, a certain level of, mo of modeling. We have micro emission models, meso and macro emission models. And the scope at uh, space and time uh, uh, is different. I will focus on microscopic emission models, which uh, uh, are able to estimate NOx emissions in one second, uh, in one, in one hertz of, of, of frequency. 
we have some examples of emission models and uh, each model uh, mm, uh, requires some kind of inputs to to the to to predict the emissions um, microscopic emission models usually needs instantaneous uh, data instantaneous speed road grade or power and more uh, data from the vehicle from each vehicle uh, in a specific La, uh, while microscopic emission models uh, are usually based on average speeds, uh, we need a um, general uh, statistics of the fleet, and also is a very important uh, data uh, variable, the kilometers traveled for each uh, vehicle. Um, Uh, ah. Well, I will continue with a basic uh, uh, introduction to the combustion. Uh, we see that if we have a theoretical complete combustion, if we have a theoretical complete combustion, uh, the fuel and the air is, uh, is fired into the, the, the engine. And the major emissions, uh, of course, are the CO2 emissions and the nitrogen uh, don't, doesn't react in the, in the engine. Um, an important variable here is the relation between air and fuel, uh, which uh, in the case of, uh, of vehicles can characterize the, the combustion. And also uh, we can see that uh, red mixtures are usually identified by an equivalence radio major, greater than one and these mixtures uh, are characterized by uh, equivalent radius lesser than one. It's important to note that uh, spark ignition engines uh, usually work close to stoichiometric uh, uh, mixtures, while diesel engines uh, work always on linear in the linear side. Sorry, guys, I, I have some problems with the. Okay. Okay, well, what happened with NOx emissions? Uh, engine out NOx emissions, of course, are a product of the combustion in the engine, uh, but uh, this corresponds to minor emissions. Uh, uh, the main source of NOx emission is the more, uh, nitro mono, mono, monoxide and this is uh, mainly explained by thermal formation. Um, uh, uh, combustion temperature is a very important variable, and we see in the plot uh, for an um, SI uh, engine, we have uh, the psychometric uh, equivalence radio, the maximum temperature, but the maximum uh, NOx emissions are produced at a slightly uh, uh, equivalence radio, a slightly link, link mixtures where the temperature is also high, but there are a, uh, a few uh, uh, link combustion and excess of air. Um, some variables that are important for NOx emissions are the combustion temperature, airflow radius, the residual gas in the chambers, and also the uh, combustion time in the chamber. Uh, the next step is the tailpipe NOx emissions. As we can see, uh, most of the fuel is converted in CO2, and um, it means that, uh, of course, uh, CO2 at uh, engine out level is almost the same uh, CO2 as the tailpipe. And there are a strong correlation between the power wheel, which is the power that the vehicle transfers to the, to the road, uh, that comes from the from the power outside of the engine and the power of the uh, from the fuel. Uh, this strong correlation is is uh, reflected in high uh, high uh, re uh, accuracy of emission models uh, that are between uh, 
0.4 to 0.9 uh, R square. In the case of NOx emissions, uh, engine out NOx emissions are reduced by NOx control systems. And of course, engine out uh, NOx emissions are greater than tailpipe NOx emissions. In this case, tailpipe NOx emissions uh, are dependent of the working conditions of the, uh, the engine and also of the working conditions of the NOx control systems. It is reflected in um, uh, R square values very low for, for the prediction of, of NOx emissions. Um, it is an important for, for emission modeling. What happened with the NOx control systems? Uh, Across the years, uh, the regulations have changed and it, it, it leads to, in the example we have, uh, uh, what are the after treatments for uh, CI engines? And we see that the complexity of the after treatments uh, are increasing acro across the years. And uh, as we know, uh, all the vehicles have to accomplish with the same emission level in, kilometer, in, in grams per kilometer, but uh, the rules for the, for the type approval have changed. Have changed the driving cycle, and now the uh, vehicles uh, have to pass the real driving emission tests. Uh, each one of the NOx control systems have some problems in their in their working. Uh, in general, a high and low load uh, reduce the capability of these systems to work. Another important factor is that uh, uh, catalytic systems like the lignose trap and selective catalytic reduction system needs uh, to light up, which means that uh, under cold start conditions they doesn't they don't work. Um, each, each, this aspect uh, limits the, the possible application of uh, or complicates the, the application of NOx modeling under uh, cold start. Um, we see that the, for a current Euro 6D uh, vehicles and future Euro 7 vehicles, uh, the after treatments are uh, high there are, have the load of devices in the system layout for NOx emissions. We have the EGR uh, and possible, usually uh, the vehicles will use a, a two SCR systems. Also, there are all other elements that maybe should be modeled, modeled uh, to, to have a accurate uh, models in in vehicles. Uh, regarding SCI engines, uh, the complexity also is increasing, but in this case, the three-way catalysts have a high, high efficiency and three-way catalyst reduce very well the NOx emissions in, in, in gasoline vehicles. Uh, also, three-way catalysts uh, have to light off before uh, to, to reduce NOx emissions, and now it, it is known that produces ammonia. Um, uh, new technologies like direct injection, which in part, in part, in part uh, operates under lean of uh, mixtures, uh, and also hybridization, which cool down the after treatment, uh, leads to a more complicated after treatment with need uh, heating and also perhaps a, a diesel-like uh, after treatments to reduce NOx emissions. Um, all these aspects uh, have led to discrepancies between the declared uh, NOx emission levels and the, and the real world emission levels. We have uh, NOx emissions in the horizontal axis of this picture and we see that uh, the average uh, discrepancy between is uh, in about in about uh, five fold uh, the declared uh, NOx emission level. There are also other vehicles uh, that are high emitters that can be uh, up to 20 uh, times the NOx emission level declared in, in vehicles. This example is for Euro 6 vehicles. Um, 
what is the, uh, the other aspect about noise emissions? We have noise emission peaks uh, from the data that I used in Madrid and, uh, and GRASS, data taken from, uh, performed under real driving tests. Uh, we analyzed the noise emission peaks and we have that uh, about 50% of the total emissions are represented in, a, in only 40 to 4 to 7% of the time. Um, it means that large amount of emissions uh, are represented in a, a small amount of time. And uh, these emission peaks uh, represent high non-linearity, which uh, uh, is hard to be modeled uh, with any um, a modeling approach. Uh, part of the work was to analyze the characteristics, what, the, what are the conditions where that, those emission, emission peaks are present, what are the influence of these emission peaks on models, and also uh, in the future I, I will uh, perform a, a model with uh, uh, that predict those emission peaks um, with the aim to improve uh, emission modeling in general. Uh, we have um, here an example of the uh, analysis of emission peaks. We can see in blue uh, the limit for the WLTC cycle and in red the limit for the NTC cycle. We have represented the speed times a positive acceleration, which is a good indicator of a specific power. We have the conditional probabilities of uh, those emission peaks to appear. Uh, and we see that uh, the probability to appear emission peaks uh, in, in B times, uh, speed times acceleration values above the, those driving cycles are very high. Um, okay, regarding modeling, um, Uh, regarding modeling, uh, for microscopic modeling, um, the more simple way to model the, the, the action of the vehicles is the use the longitudinal dynamics, which is a zero-dimensional zero model. In this case, uh, the objective is to obtain the power wheel. The power wheel, uh, we see that it's an important uh, predictor for emissions models. Uh, the power wheel uh, represents some uh, uh, forces that uh, the vehicle have to, to overcome. Uh, for the power wheel, we have constants. And here it's important uh, that power wheel can be represented only for three variables, uh, speed, acceleration, and road grade. These variables are uh, pretty useful because it uh, can be obtained from GPS and can be obtained also from, from traffic simulation, driving cycles, and in general, the speed time profiles. Samir, quick comment. We are a little bit behind of schedule, so if you could speed up a little bit. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, uh, it's important for modeling that we have two types of, uh, uh, of variables, external operating variables and internal operating variables. And in the study of Frey, uh, uh, we have a difference uh, emission accuracy for this type, two type of variables. Uh, of course, uh, internal operating variables uh, reflect better the, of the, the, uh, the behavior of NOx emissions and can improve uh, the emission modeling. Well, um, in one paper we are writing and we try to use a, a, the mode from VSP to combine with internal operation, operating variables uh, from engine maps. In this case, we can improve uh, the emission accuracy uh, with relationship to the BSP conventional model. Also, uh, as I would say, uh, physical modeling uh, uh, is the method, uh, the best method to, to, to model uh, microscopy at microscopic level. But uh, indeed, uh, physical modeling or the after treatment uh, in a zero D approach is very complicated. We need a lot of data, a lot of information. 
but in this case, we uh, physical models can be improved with uh, the use of machine learning of big data. Um, in another work, uh, we are trying to use FEM, which is a physical model, and we, we will work to we will replace the FEM 0D thermal model of the after treatment with a machine learning model. In this case, we don't need to model each of the elements of the after treatment layout, and we take a jump uh, with a machine learning model. Um, well, several final aspects are uh, mission models, uh, need to close the, the cycle. Um, in the case of CO2, fuel, fuel consumption of fuel sales are useful to validate what emission models uh, predict. And in the case of pollutants, we have uh, air quality measurements and models. Of course, uh, emission models need a, a certain quantity and quality of input data. In the case of uh, Latin America, we have uh, restrictions in budgets, in funding, and in equipment. So I think it's important to implement uh, the registration of uh, uh, BKIT for in municipalities, for example. It's important for macro emission models. Uh, also, the cost of PEMS or laboratories is high, so we can use SEMS, perhaps, in, in Latin America. Also, it's important, it's important to develop driving cycles uh, and also to take uh, traffic measurements. In the case of uh, the validation of the pollutants, uh, it's important to, to have sensors and low-cost sensors and uh, increase in the amount of these sensors can be useful. Uh, for the case of Latin America. Thank you for your attention. And uh, sorry, I take uh, more time. <laughs> it's fine. Thank you, Zami, for your presentation. Really interesting that you are using, that you want to take a machine learning approach. It will be, it will bring a very nice paper, the comparison with the FEM. So now let's see how are the PEMS results in Chile with Kevin. Please. Thank you, and go ahead. Okay, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Let me get the right. Can you see and hear me well? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm gonna, I'm Kevin Basoa, and I'm a mechanical engineer from the University, the, from the Universidad de Tecnología Metropolitana in Chile. And I'm going to talk about uh, an evaluation of TDI engine nitrogen oxide emissions uh, in Chile measured with PEMS. Uh, this is a, a straightforward presentation that, that shows uh, what, what we measure and, and, and the results that we get. So the contents of this presentation is uh, well, a, a little bit of motivation and backgrounds. Uh, what is PEM? What is going on in, in PEMS in Chile? And the experimental methodology that we use, uh, the results, and uh, final conclusions. Well, as some motivation, we have in Chile um, and and also in, in a lot of um, a, a lot of countries uh, problems in, in air quality. And, and in Chile, particularly, we, we have a lot of saturated uh, cities for, um, saturated with uh, particular matters. Uh, uh, um, Mainly in in the south of Chile, with the uh, with the wood wood, uh, wood combustion in, in residential house in the house, uh, but also in the in the cities, the the transport sector is an important contribution to that. So uh, it's important to 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 the cities that this this uh, this met this measurement. Also in Chile, we 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 have that um, strong regulations uh, because uh, now uh, they have to. To, to comply with the Euro 5 uh, regulation. And, and, and uh, just uh, about a, a month ago, uh, I, I think we, we just promulgated the Euro 6 standards. The, the, um, not, not yet applied, but, but it, it is, is promulgated. This is a, a nice picture of, of Santiago. That then you, you, can, you can see the atmospheric boundary layer that, that, that holds all the, all the pollutants in the city. So uh, a little bit of background, uh, like I said before, uh, Chile just promulgated the, the, um, the Euro 6 um, um, emission standards. And 
also I, I'm I'm want I wanted to show this uh, this graph or this bar that that shows the um, the amount of vehicles sold in, in each countries, uh, including the, in North America and, and some countries of, of South America. But we we can focus on, on Chile and, and, and USA. Um, the, the units are in, in thousand units, so um, just to, to keep that in mind. Uh, the thing that, that I wanted to say in, in with this graph is that in, there is my cat. Sorry, <laughs> um, we we have a, a, a lot of 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 sold in in in, in all the countries. Uh, obviously, um, is is dominated by by the amount of people. But we, if we can if we can if, if we do the, the the relation between the amount of, of, of vehicles sold and the people, Chile is, is one of the is is the the major in in, in this um, in this variable because you sold a, a lot of vehicles uh, despite having uh, uh, less less people. Uh, it's not uh, yet like uh, USA, but it's pretty high. It's more high in in, in South America. So the the, the thing that what I wanted to say is. Uh, even if you are advancing to to regulation to to uh, electrifying the transport, you also want to have uh, you will have a, a lot of vehicle that that you have to measure or you have to take care of in the future. Uh, so uh, this uh, a, 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 a brief introduction to to PEMS Chile. Mauricio uh, explained uh, uh, earlier the, uh, pretty well the what we are doing in Chile. But, is mainly we are working two universities, uh, the Universidad Tecnológica Metropolitana and the Universidad um, Técnica Federico Santa Maria, um, that are supported by this this project from DEF to to develop the, the capacity or, or, or build the capacity to to use PEMS in Chile. We also are working with with a local local uh, a, a, a local development or. or Technology uh, and also an institution for from USA that um, ISSRC and the UCR uh, University from from California. So, getting more in the in what we what we do in this project, we measure five vehicles uh, the, the, um, with TDI engines. That uh, four of them uh, were were uh, complying with the Euro six uh, standard and one of them uh, for the Euro four. This is, these are the, uh, the, the NOx uh, emissions uh, that, that come from the laboratory, the, the, the certificate that, that they get when they enter to the country. Um, so I'm going to pass to the next. Uh, we measure this, uh, like, a, a, like the presentation say with PEM. So we made a, a route with, the, um, with all of them. We make uh, two, two measures for each, each one. So we, this route, um, have like a, a 40, 14 uh, kilometers and goes up to the to the foot of the the mountain and goes up to uh, seven uh, seven hundred uh, meters of, of altitude and and the test uh, last last like uh, for, uh, forty minutes uh, more or less. Uh, the instrument that we use we use a electric flow meter that and, and a septic um, uh, equipment, and you can see that uh, this one of, was one of the measurements. Uh, we go up to the hill or, or the foot of the hill, and the result. This is a, a key graph the, that that shows um, the different results for each um, for each test. Uh, for, uh, for the vehicle uh, three, we 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 actually do three tests. So we we got we we focus. First, on the, um, the red line that shows um, the emission standard limit, that, that is um, that, that they, they have to comply with when they enter to the country. And then we have the uh, light blue uh, bar or, or, or line that is the laboratory measurement that, that, that is done in, in Chile. We, we have a, a, a great laboratory in Chile that, that, uh, that tests all, all the vehicles that, that, are, that are coming to the country. So, as you expect, the the laboratory emissions are, are, are pretty are, are low than than the, the emission standards. But the the gray bars, or in this case a black bar, 
uh, shows uh, what we see in the measurements uh, in the real driving image that that we measure. So everyone uh, our pass the, the the standard on the laboratory uh, as you also expect. So if we focus on the on the first bar that is the standard uh, the standard limit, we we can see that how the emissions compare. Uh, that the emission that we obtain with this line. So in this case, all the vehicles exceed the exceed the, the limits. Uh, all, uh, is what it was we 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 also we respect we with the real driving emissions. In uh, in this case, they, they go up to uh, four point five times uh, higher. But if we compare with the laboratory measurements, that uh, one of the the, the things that, that that we wanted to 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 prove in this that, that, that the, the the measurements in the laboratory uh, are pretty much uh, uh, lower than the, than the real driving emissions. So in in this case, the, the emissions go up to uh, almost six uh, times bigger. So this is a um, this is what what we obtain uh, from this test. So uh, as a conclusion, we. With this um, this result that we obtained, uh, the result showed that, that five vehicles exceed the emission limit uh, of laboratory values obtained by the 3CB, that is the, the laboratory fr the, from Chile that, that, test, uh, that test all the vehicles. However, these values, are, like I say, are expected in an, on, on, in an on road measurement. But uh, the, this, uh, this, um, this measurement exceeds the rates uh, uh, like uh, from 1.7 to to almost six times in, in the, the laboratory emissions. Um, we also have that the result uh, seem reasonable for in-use in emission testing with PEMS. Uh, emissions vary range from 0 0.5 grams per kilometer per kilometer up to 0 0.9 uh, grams per kilometer. So these values are comparable with values obtained in other studies. Uh, this is this is a key point because. These values are, are comparable with, with the with the other study that that, that do the digital gate, uh, the the West Virginia study. Um, as a main conclusion, that we have the the, the, the TDA engine, but uh, man, man, they maintain the on road levels in Chile, but the emission standard, um, it, it's, the emission standard in Chile are, are pretty are, are much higher than that the that they were compared in, in other studies. So. Uh, it, it's high, but it, it is still acceptable. So uh, finally, uh, our remarks that it, 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 that the, the key of this is that we we have to to do more more work to um, in in testing vehicles in in the real world. We, uh, I think in the panel we all agree that we need to 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 test to to measure. Uh, it is it is difficult, but we we, we need to do that. Um, uh, and we are encouraged that uh, with, with with this project uh, and the, the, the two universities. So this is a final uh, photograph. Uh, this this is a work that that is done by a lot of people. I, I'm just uh, one of them. So uh, thank you and, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Kevin. Great presentation. It's really interesting the work that you are doing. Uh, with the PEMS work, with your team, with Mauricio and Sebastian Tolbert and all the guys. And one interesting thing that I found is that the, we can discuss it later after the presentation of Andre. But I was thinking that the new emission standard, as I, as I have read, they may allow some exceedance values using PEMS in, in comparison with the, with the emission standard. I'm not sure. Maybe we can. We can, someone could uh, verify this. But now, I, uh, Andre have some problems with the internet, and because he's now as he's measuring pants actually <laughs> in Rio de Janeiro, and now he's going to enter with the with his cell phone. And now we can I just wait for him and I will pass the slides for him. So if we could just wait, but also uh, you can start talking a little bit after uh, and he arrives. Okay. Andre, I mean, let's see. Okay. 
Very good. Ah, sometimes it's very difficult. Okay, don't trust in the internet, especially here. But okay, I'm ready. So I let, let's go in this way. I will start your presentation and you will talk. So you can so, so you can tell me when we uh, going to the next slide. Okay. Okay, let's go. I will start presentation and hide and present. Are you seeing the presentation? Mm -hmm. ah. Yeah, and that's fine. Okay, guys. Hello to everyone. I'm Andrea Forceto. I'm doctor, doctor, student in the São Paulo University. Uh, Serge is my colleague in the university. It's a pleasure to to be here to share uh, something about the development of a pen, low cost pen system in Brazil. Okay, go ahead, Serge. Next one. Okay. okay. Uh, Jose said it before. Uh, the main problems in Brazil are ozone and particulate matter, and uh, the ozone is very difficult to, to reduce the program to control vehicular pollution. In Brazil, is very successful, but for uh, carbon monoxide, for particulate matter, for sulfur, but not for ozone for now. But we are trying, we are developing the next steps to, to reduce it. And one characteristic of our atmosphere is a high level of aldehydes and uh, hydrocarbons also. The, the main fleet in, in Brazil, the light duty passenger cars, is almost gasoline or ethanol uh, vehicles, just uh, off engines. We have almost no diesel engines because the diesel price here in Brazil is lower because uh, has lower taxes to reduce freight prices for example. So it's prohibited for light uh, duty cars, for passenger cars. And almost all car, uh, almost cars and motorcycles are flex fuel car or flex fuel motorcycle. When I say it is mean that the, the car or the motorcycle is able to burn ethanol or gasoline, petrol, in any proportion of mystery. Okay. And the, the Brazilian gasoline contains almost one quarter of ethanol, uh, about 20 to 25, 27% of ethanol. So the aldehyde level in uh, our atmosphere is very high. Okay, uh, let's go. Next one. Sergio? Ah, okay. Uh, the next proposed phase is the pollution control program. You establish to introduce the RD test. So uh, you are introducing the pens here in Brazil. But the regulatory pens, uh, you can see in this picture, uh, it, it's a regulatory pens. Is able to measure NOx, CO, CO2, and hydrocarbon. And here in Brazil, we are measuring hydrocarbons in the RD test because it's very important to us. The, the NOx is a problem specific for heavy dust vehicles, but for light dust vehicles, the hydrocarbon emission is very important to us. Okay, next one. Fine. Uh, the regulatory pens uh, have uh, this system has advantages that uh, to allow to measure in the real world. Uh, it, this system has a, a good precision, it is almost equivalent to laboratory grade in instruments. But the disadvantages, uh, it's also said before. 
this system is very heavy. We found something about 150 to 200 kilos. But considering pens, the bottle gases, batteries, computer from meter, and so, 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 it's, it's very heavy, very big, costly also. It's, it's a turnkey system. Uh, it means that a turnkey system is possible to add or to remove something easily. We need to pay a lot to, to modify something, and sometimes it's impossible to attend our needs, to, to research needs. Okay? Well, go on. So, uh, we are developing uh, a project we call low cost pens with a low weight, with some characteristics, a, a low weight system, compact, tailor made. So, uh, when I say tailor made, is, for example, the interesting cases, the interesting pollutants for us is CO2, CO, and hydro hydrocarbons. And we are not measuring NOx. And it's very interesting because they are the, in Europe and in many uh, research works are focused on uh, NOx. And here we are focusing on carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and hydrocarbon uh, because they, are, they have, uh, they are important for the pollution, for the formation of ozone in the metropolitan regions. So, uh, Sergio, let's go to the next one. Uh, choose, I uh, would like to share something. It's uh, the picture of the, the commercial paints. So, just a click to change the picture. Okay, and it's uh, our system that we are developing. Uh, the, the car is on the laboratory, dynamometer, and in the center is the system. It is still not a commercial one, but very uh, tailor-made system, okay? And the sensors are on my hand in the picture in the right. Uh, we are testing electrochemical sensors and electrocatalytic sensors also. Uh, they have some issues, they have some qualities, and uh, the main quality that they are very cheap, but the precision is not so good. Okay, next one. This whole system is not more than 20 kilos. This system, uh, we, we pay we, we expand better. We expand not more than uh, one thousand dollars. Uh, very very low cost. Here very low cost. Okay. We have some challenges. It's not perfect yet. The sensors measurement range is it's a problem because the electrochemical uh, is limiting. By the high level emission, the catalyst, the electrocatalyst sensor has difficult to measure low hydrocarbon concentration. So you are working to solve this or to achieve a, a, some equivalence about this. Uh, we have problems also uh, with humidity from the air because the, the how exhaust pipe gas is mixed with uh, atmospheric air, is diluted to allow, to, to preserve the sensors uh, about the high humidity levels and high temperature. Uh, but the, this humidity from the air influences the, the measurement in the, the sensors. Uh, and the accuracy level is still to be determined. It's not clear for us. Uh, at this moment, but we, we made some some tests last week and today another week, 
and uh, we are still processing the data. So the next step is for us is the data analysis, uh, uh, comparing the laboratory with these low cost pens. And after this, we will try, uh, respect, we hope, okay, to do on hold measurements, not only in uh, using the RD procedure, but also uh, off the procedure in the traffic jam, in, in, in highways, in, and so on, so on. Uh, testing every time with ethanol and after changing to gasoline and comparing the, the, hue, the hazards, okay? And one thing to, to think now is uh, when you say hydrocarbons, it's very interesting because we are measuring for type approval proposals and for a lot of analysis, we are measuring hydrocarbons is the uh, FID analyzer. The, the mm -hmm. transition detector. And this kind of instrument is good to measure hydrocarbons, okay, but it's not so good to specify which kind of hydrocarbon is passing on in the pipe. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and uh, different substances we have differently in the atmosphere, uh, causing different levels of ozone. So the, it's a, one thing to think about to, the, the way that you are measuring hydrocarbons in your tests, in your research. Okay, uh, but it will be the next step for me after the doctorate. Uh, uh, I'm planning to to do a post doctorate and, and uh, working with this. Okay, uh, guys, thank you for your attention. I'm pleasant to, to be here and uh, learn a lot. Okay, if, if you have some questions, I have pleasure to, to answer. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, thank you, uh, Andre. Oh. Man, that, it's really interesting, your project, what you're trying to do is like this during the last five years, this like uh, this tsunami of low cost, low cost sensors trying to measure air pollution, correcting the errors. There are several re uh, review papers about that, but you're trying to go behind of that. You're trying to do a low cost pen sensor, which uh, at least mm. they haven't heard about it. So it's really interesting. And now, Thank we you. have been, we started with ozone and we end with ozone. We started with air quality and we, we end with a PEMS development for, for PEMS, the PEMS development. We also saw uh, some machine learning approaches to estimate the emissions second by second in comparison with the FEM model. We also saw a really state-of-the-art review of, of the PEMS, uh, RSD, and many other techniques, measuring emissions measurements, presented by Robin Smith and also Dr. Carl uh, Robkins. Mm -hmm. And also we, we've seen some, uh, some interesting approaches by this new ongoing project of PEMS Chile, where they are me measuring PEMS, and if you see, I, I would like to ask you a favor now. Imagine that we are now, we are not in a conference room. We are now outside of the conference room. Everybody is standing. We are in the circle now because we are because of the pandemic, right? And we would like to talk. So I would like to hear some of your thoughts. What do you, uh, what do you think? And, and if you have this opportunity, what would you like to ask? Uh, uh, I see that machine learning will be a very useful tool. Uh, I, I'm, I, uh, I haven't the skills to, to use this tool for now, okay? But uh, probably, probably, It'll be very interesting to, to process the data 
esse Machine Learning System? Uh, uh, sim, yes, to, to perfeiçoar, to, to improve the data analysis. Sure, sure. Anyone else? Yes, sir, here. Uh, I have several questions, but maybe one for Robin. I remember, I think you were talking about using copper in Australia. We're also using copper here in Chile. And I wanted to know the experience of using this uh, European model <clears throat> adapted into Australia. I think you have your own version of copper, or maybe I'm wrong. So because we are using the data, the, the visual factors from, from Europe, trying to adapt them to our fleet, making all, you know, the arrangements and uh, deterioration and some other factors. So I just wanted to know if uh, your experience with copper there. Uh, yes, Mauricio. So um, basically, we, um, because I used to work in Europe, of course, I'm from, from Holland. I know uh, my European colleagues very well. Um, and basically, we had a lot of uh, fecal emissions uh, data uh, in Australia. So we had a very good position to uh, to develop an Australian version uh, of Copert. Um, so we basically set up a project with um, with the European colleagues to develop this, and we made some changes in uh, the classification, what I mentioned. We, um, we made some changes in terms of the, the methods. So we developed our hot running emission factors differently, um, but we still use the, the Copert platform. So we, we basically, um, used lots of Australian emissions data to recalibrate and also to restructure some of the Copert software. Um, in my knowledge, it's the only uh, other uh, international version of Copert. Copert is still uh, European based, um, but we felt it was necessary because uh, because of the local uh, situation here and, and the, the large errors you get if you apply Copert uh, directly into Australia because of the different fleet. And I, I, I suspect it's quite different, at least in some countries. Um, for example, um, in Brazil, where you have, I think, the ethanol, uh, high ethanol content in the petrol, um, lagging emission standards as well, as, as we have, have here. Uh, I'm not sure if there's uh, inspection and maintenance programs in, in South American countries. Yeah, so there's, there's lots of potential differences um, with European uh, data sets and adopting European emission factors directly into different country, you have to be really careful if that is our experience. Um, but have, coming back to your questions, it was uh, quite, a, uh, quite a, a big project because there was lots of data analysis and lots of model developments and uh, intense interactions with uh, our European colleagues uh, to translate it into a co version. Uh, which is separate from, from Copert in Europe, basically. Okay, thank you. You can go, Carl. So I was just going to quickly mention this. Um, Robin mentioned earlier the fact that, that we've got inspection and maintenance programs, and I wanted to just point out the fact that we, we do have things like the MOT in the UK, but they are not good inspections. I've got to point out here, the Americans do this a way sight better than us. Europe's lagging behind on America on inspection and maintenance type activity. They've got um, PTI, um, which is periodic testing and, and inspection scheme coming in. That's in, in Germany and some other areas of Europe, but it really isn't in, in all of Europe yet. So we, we are still a little bit behind there ourselves. Well, uh, if, I don't know if someone would you like to comment about the Brazilian program inspection uh, program? Oh dear, sorry, have I? <laughs> Would you like? No, I, I think following your comment, uh, Carl, someone quick comment. Would you like someone of our Brazilian colleagues comment, make a comment about the uh, Brazilian program uh, inspection and maintenance program? Would you like to? Ah, is your mute? Andres, we are, we can hear you. No, but the thing is that we yeah don't worry. We, I I want to mention that because we haven't <laughs> like we we don't have inspection 
and my tennis program here in Brazil. Just that. Yeah, we, we used to have it some years ago, but uh, only in some, some cities. We had it in Sao Paulo for a couple of years and uh, in Rio de Janeiro also, we had for many years in here. But uh, I think uh, the program was ended in 2015, if I'm not wrong. And since then, we, we don't have any type of uh, control on emissions. So if you are talking about the difficulties of and the magnitude of errors for just inputting an external model indirectly into, a, in this case, Latin America, you have to be very careful about all the considerations, right? So who else would you like to make another comment, another thought they would like to hear, please? I have another question for Carl. Uh, Carl, you mentioned that the, you, you showed us a, a picture of NOx with different euros, and you said that NOx was not that different between Euro, Euro 0 to Euro 5, but you could see a, a jump down in Euro 6. Is it the same for PM or is it different? Do you remember? Ah. Okay. Um, in the set of slides, there is actually a slide right at the back. If, um, if you, I'll send you the slides if you want to have a look. But very quickly, um, what, we, what, we saw, um, what we saw there was when we, like I say, Euro 3, 4, 5, wasn't much change in NOx. Um, likewise, there wasn't much change in PM10. And when we went to Euro 6, which uh, in particular, when we were looking at the Euro 6 Bs and Cs after Dieselgate, there was significant improvement in NOx levels. At the same time, NO2 goes through the roof. So the proportion of NOx that is, is primary NO2 is increased hugely. And particulate goes through the roof for the lorries. Not so bad for the buses but for the lorries. But here again, you need to be careful because the lorries that we're looking at on the, on, in the real world on the roads are lorries under load. Mm -hmm. They've got high loads in the back. They're carrying loads. They're running mm -hmm. hot. Whereas the buses are often running cold because they're doing lots of stop start in urban areas. So they're, they're suboptimally driving for their emission control systems for the management of NOx, but not for particulate. So unfortunately, we've got bad conditions for the lorries for particular, bad conditions for the buses for NOx. Oh, sorry, oh. sorry for NO, NO2. Right. And any measurements for NH3? Um, not in that data set, but in other data sets. And yes, that's going through the roof as well. All right, thanks. But sorry, you would expect that with the way the, uh, with the, way the management systems have been designed to handle. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Can I ask a question at this point as well? Um, in some countries, I've seen I've seen emission data from vehicles, and this is in a country where Euro six doesn't exist yet. Euro, Euro six hasn't been implemented yet but you can buy Euro 6 vehicles. So you can buy a nice expensive new car, import it into an area, and I'm not gonna name the countries involved. They're, um, they're no one here. But in both cases, some of those vehicles that were purchased as Euro 6s were not Euro 6s, even though they were told they were when they were delivered, what they got wasn't a Euro 6. And in some cases, the Euro 6 engine management system wasn't actually set up. So they'd get a vehicle which, for all intents and purposes, said it was a Euro 6, but it wasn't. Has anyone here encountered anything like that? Not really, but we have seen here in Chile when the diesel vehicles have a DPF system. Uh, most of the companies, especially in the north of Chile, they are taking away, taking off the, the system. So. The, the, the car that happens that, elsewhere yeah, as well. And because they, they are claiming that the, it, it gets stuck because these vehicles are not making a big trips or sorry, long trips. So the, the system is not cleaning it's, itself. So in the end, they decide just to, to take it away. And that's really bad. But I, I haven't heard of what you said, uh, yeah. buying a Euro 6, which is not really a Euro 6. 
we have, by the way, on the same point, we, we at one stage saw um, with the gas regulation systems, ga garages were regularly not repaired because they were hard, to, they were expensive to keep running. For so where the gas um, where the gas was recirculated back through the engine if it wasn't clean enough and burnt again and then run through the um, abatement system again, that quite often the return valve was actually sealed closed by the garage because after after a vehicle had been back several times with a fault when it was under warranty they didn't want it to come back again so they actually basically stop up that recirculation valve rather than try to fix it. Mm -hmm. We have seen that as well. Yeah. Well, another another issue is the two wheelers of motorcycles, because here in in Latin America they are really really common, especially in Brazil, Colombia, Chile is lower, but we are starting to have with the, the delivery with the, this COVID situation the motorcycles going all over the place, and the emissions are really really high. So this is uh, very. Is. Yeah, so the these uh, equipments like uh, the the low cost and with a not that heavy uh, pump systems are very good for testing these emissions and we're trying to do that with some guys in Medellin in in Colombia and it's, it is possible but we need smaller and not that heavy pumps equipment so I was really interested in listening what Andre was was saying because uh, even if the the accuracy is not that good. We need to test those vehicles because, for example, copper, they don't have good emission factor for motorcycles, as far as I know. <clears throat> um, we're in the same position with that one as well. Oh, sorry, I, I was wondering, sorry. <laughs> no, feel free. Uh, your plan is in your horizon to, to adapt our system to motorcycles, okay? Uh, it's not so difficult for our system because it's very light, very small. And the main problem to us at this moment is to how to evaluate the SF's flow. Yes, so, that's the, big, uh, the, the main problem. Just... Yeah, <laughs> because nowadays we are using OPT data from, from the ECU, from the engine, okay? Uh, and from motorcycles, it's very difficult to, to get this data. So, uh, but maybe the uh, Python system will be useful to measure this, the exhaust flow and uh, so can be adapted to a motorcycle. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it will be very interesting to test motorcycles with a pass. We, um, we have been looking at the same thing, by the way, and you have, you have two options to think about here, by the way. You, you can look at a fuel flow measurement instead, as in, see, so you've got the CO2, you've got the other species, and you can do the ratios from that. You've got the fuel flow, which can get you to an estimate of the exhaust flow. flow. So you can sort of go take it from another direction rather than actually take the, take the, flow, measure off the, take the flow measurement off the OBD, which is going to be tricky with a lot of motorcycles because they don't share yeah. their OBD yeah. protocols. Yeah. Motorcycles in Brazil, the, the OBD from, of the motorcycles in Brazil is very difficult to access data. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, other uh, okay, the other trouble is you need a fast response sensor because the so motorcycles are so... Mm, the flow rate, the slow rate in a motorcycle is so variable and so quick to move that it's a real challenge to actually monitor that nicely. Um, yeah. However, they, they, we are getting an increasing fleet as well through similar thing, uh, similar routes that we're getting um, scoot, a lot of scooters in particular, doing a lot of deliveries with a lot of heavy loads on the back of the bikes, and they are being driven really hard by young kids who are doing lots of work. So I'm afraid their emissions are going through the roof. Mm -hmm. I, I received a phone call when Rafael was talking, so I, I'm not sure, but I, I think you, you mentioned uh, chips or measuring big engines. Uh, I'm not sure if you, you, you mentioned that, because uh, here in Chile, we are, we are getting a lot of requirements to use our pens to measure off-road machinery. So big, big engines, even backup generators. And 
So we, we're thinking of how to do that. And again, how to, how to measure the flow is, is one of the issues because, not because it's a small engine, it's, it's, this is the other problem around. And so we are trying to make some measurements on uh, off-road machinery, different sizes. So I don't know if maybe it's, it's a similar problem than that the, you, Rafael, were mentioning. Well, it could be similar. Uh, that's actually, uh, thanks, Mauricio, for, for the question. Uh, this is actually a question that I'd like to uh, ask you guys, because most of what we do with numerical models and the model that we, we are developing, uh, we are basically depend a lot on the work that you guys are doing. You guys are the heroes who are doing, uh, who are monitoring emission levels at the ground level with PEMS. And all the emission level, emission factors that we have, that we depend on to do our models, depend on the, on the work that you guys do. Um, uh, and I'm wondering if you guys have had the chance of doing your, uh, applying, using your PEMS uh, methods and equipment to measure uh, subway stations or uh, trains or light light rail light rail vehicles and so on, because uh, we are finding a bit hard to find emission factors for rail transport modes. So not not so much in heavy uh, duty vehicles, but specifically in rail rail modes. Chris Frey's done work on rail. Um, Chris Frey in the states. Um, North Carolina State University. They've produced some work on um, trains. We've, in the UK, we're, we're just starting to look at it, but we haven't really got anything nice yet. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember I saw once a project that was the Astrid project. It was a joint work between the Netherlands, the UK, and Brazil. And I remember, I can't remember his name, but I think he was based at UCL, University College London. And they were measuring uh, with PEMS emission levels within the tube in London, depending on whether the subway, uh, the tube had uh, air conditioning or not, whether the windows were open or not. And the results were terrifying. Like the level of PM uh, 2.5 in the, in the tube stations were really, really high, specific, especially in the old tube stations, which are smaller, like very low ceiling. Yep. Yeah. You've got you've, you've got sorry you've got a world of things against you down there when you start. Um, firstly, all the dust in the city ends up at the lowest point in the city. So firstly, they've got a lot of material coming in from outside and just staying there, and just yeah. being pushed up and down the tube by the piston action of the trains. The trains themselves produce a lot of particulate, as they're going to, a lot of that particulate down there is iron, mm -hmm. which is basically an um, electrolysis of the wires from the from the charge cables. There's some very old diesel trains in some parts of the tube, which we'll keep very quiet about because they still don't like you talking about them. Um, and the other trouble is that monitoring in the UK on the tube system is actually illegal without the permission of the owners of the trains. Wow. Under UK law, you're not allowed to monitor down there unless you have their permission. So you can guess how often they give you permission to monitor down there. Um, so there isn't, there isn't a lot of data, but you, you sort of have to i to say this nicely. You go on the tube in London, and afterwards you blow your nose, and it's black. You realise there's a problem down there. There are some some of the new sections are much cleaner, much better ventilated, much better controlled, and they are. It's surprising the difference. But yes, it is scary in certain areas. I'm afraid. To put but, it nicely. Right? Yeah. <laughs> to what degree? We we always have that problem when we're quantifying the difference between um, quantifying the non-exhaust emissions from vehicles, that it gets really complicated when you start looking at the things like tire wear versus resuspension versus brake wear, what, how you source a portion that. Mm -hmm. And it's an even bigger challenge on the tube. Yeah. But you know, I, I think like even in, in other cities like in Sao Paulo or Rio or even Stockholm or Tokyo, I don't know. Uh, Rail transport systems, they are responsible for a really big chunk of the population that is moving about in cities. And, and you do have quite a lot of PM that is being produced by the, by the brakes and the, the tearing of the, of the iron and, and the rail and so on, and the tracks. And so, yeah, I was just 
I'm very curious to look at the, 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 the work that you got that you mentioned, Carl, to see to what extent we can extrapolate the admission factors that they are developing for the US to different cities. Although they they will as Robin said in the beginning of his talk, there is always this uh, this caveat that this global models they, they try to be replicable to every part in the world. They are they are sh they fall short into accounting for the specific specificities of different yes. cities, and you know the a tr the technology of a, a diesel train in Sao Paulo is probably very much different from the diesel train in Wales or. I'm going to keep quiet about that because I don't actually know. Right, uh, the the tech difference in the technology of the cars can be very different. Yeah. Some of the some of the trains we've got are 15, 20 years old, and some of the the they're recondition they recondition the engine quite regularly, but they the technology is quite a way back. Mm -hmm. Just because there's been no need to accelerate it, and in fact, the government has allowed the government has allowed diesel trains to run on a very poor quality diesel for quite a while in the UK, compared to what they'd let a car run on, simply because they were trying to make the trains more cost effective to encourage mm -hmm. more people onto them. Because we still have that problem that we're not giving a good we're not getting a mo good modal shift onto trains. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, the other the other thing quickly mention is. An American train is very different to a UK train in the same way that a UK bus is very different to the buses in many other countries. Yeah. We are one of the few places with double deckers as a quick example of that. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. We have been talking about interesting things. One, one thing, one key issue is that the pandemic broke the importance of the motorcycle emissions, all right? Then uh, Rafael talked about the rain mode emissions, but now I would like to, like, I would, I would like to move away a little bit, but there's a problem when we're talking about the exposure and we were talking about air pollutant concentrations. The problem is that sometimes, and Andre mentioned the hydrocarbons problem, the hydrocarbons is difficult to measure because hydros, hydrocarbons is a soup, okay? It's not one pollutant. There are hundreds of pollutants. But what we enter into the air quality models are groups of hydrocarbons, right? So uh, we have a lot of uh, aldehydes here in Brazil. And I was, I was wondering if you guys who work with PEMS, do you know if there's some work or is it possible to measure some hydrocarbon species directly or maybe some discrete measurement with using PEMS? Is it possible to do that? Uh, Mr. Call is better to answer than me. Uh, I, I saw in a research or a paper from Leeds University about the use of FTR to measure hydrocarbons. Uh, Mr. Call, Mr. Hawkins. Um, yes, okay. Right, we yes, have. Very interesting paper. Um, yes, uh, right. That, I'm trying to start with that. Um, FTR, FTIR is a little bit of a black art. It will give you lots of species, but the real, the real important thing with it is that you carefully analyze the data because of the way it works, because it Fourier transforms and tries to extract multiple species from a spectra that isn't discrete species. Um, it's, right. it's interesting, but some of it needs a pinch of salt. So I'm going to quickly say that as someone that's worked with one before. Um, we can get some good data out of them, but you do need to be really careful to not just set them up, run them, and forget, and treat them like any other instrument. They really, you really need to interpret the results really carefully and look for silly little things in the data. We see, for instance, cases in our data set where the Fourier transform will tell us that the emissions are full of heptane, but no octane or hexane. So one, one straight chain alkane, but not the next one up and the next one down, which makes no sense if your source is something like a, something like an exhaust system of, of a hydrocarbon fuel being burnt. So they do need a little bit of careful handling of the data, but you can get nice data out of them. We've got we've got nice data out of those in the lab. They're more challenging to get good data out of on the road because of the condition, it, too much is varying. 
I don't, I'm not a happy, I'm not a fan of the FTR on, on road at the moment. But in the lab, in the dyno, we've got good data out of them, certainly. Um, we have got some good data out of, hmm, we've got some good data out of other techniques every now and again, different things, different applications. Um, so we've got some nice data on, we've actually got some really nice data on ammonia using some of the low cost sensors. You put two low cost sensors together, one, two of the NOx sensors together, one of them's cross sensitive to ammonia, one of them isn't. The difference between the two gives you a nice track on ammonia. Mm -hmm. If it's a hot sensor in an exhaust pipe, you get a really nice result off that. And that's a really nice, cheap little thing you can, anyone can do. Um, the, right, okay. Um, I, some of the optical methods will give you speciation. It's just how much time and how much money you, you're going to be able to chuck at the question, I'm afraid, is a big part of the problem. Um, and then there's the question of if it's a really expensive technique, you can't do it lots of times. And the trouble is if you can't do it lots of times, you're entirely reliant on that one or two vehicles scaling up to be the fleet. And that's a dangerous situation to be in. And likewise, yeah. one or two drive cycles or one or two on-road routes being the sole data that you've got to scale up to the fleet. So you really need to look at methods that you can apply widely, which is why the work on low, low cost sense, um, sensors and low cost PEMs is the really important thing here, because we need that fleet coverage. Um, remote sensing is nice because it gives you lots of vehicles, but it only gives you one measurement per vehicle. So you don't know what the vehicle's doing the rest of the time. Likewise, PEMs is really great because it gives you lots of measurements of a vehicle, but if you can't apply it to lots of vehicles, you don't get that sample. You need to actually re to give other people those nice emission factors, those robust emission factors going to the emission models. So I'm afraid we're, we're all, um, this is why I say I'm looking at how we measure things better. Because every time I do a measurement, I come away thinking, I wish I'd done it better than that. So I would Doesn't like to, every time. maybe I can add to Carl here is that uh, basically reiterating what I showed in the presentation is that a tunnel study can be quite useful um, because you can actually speciate the VOCs with, with high quality equipment. Um, and this is how we picked up this, this quite large issue with our speciated VOCs and PAHs as well. So we did observe quite large areas and I remember that, uh, and also on sort of on road or near road sampling uh, with tumor canisters, for example, and late analysis has proven quite uh, useful to detect the differences with the, the profiles and the emission models. Uh, for example, we found ethanol uh, is not one of the uh, components in Copert's uh, VOC profiles, but we definitely observed it in our uh, VOC, measured VOC profiles. Um, and that's basically because we're using E10. Um, we also have 10% ethanol in our uh, petrol fuels. So that's another, and that would be uh, also applicable to, to Brazil, um, I would expect. Uh, and I think Carl touched on another point here that, uh, that, that it, we also struggle with as well. I mean, Australia is a rich country, but we're still very limited in, in what we can do and measure. Um, so this PEM study where we look at five SUVs is very specifically targeted SUVs because those vehicles are not measured in Europe. Um, so we have limited resources and we need to make sure that we uh, update our emission factors um, for specific parts of the fleet that are um, that are not measured overseas or that are very relevant for the emission profiles. Uh, and I think that's another important point is that when you look at your detailed uh, uh, classification of the fleet, not all the vehicles have the same importance. Uh, some of them are really important. So you have to really think about which which ones are the most important ones to to update your emission factors for and, for, and target your uh, variety of methods, if you can, uh, to update those emission, uh, emission factors in your models? Well, uh, now I would like to tell, I would like to thank you, everybody. I would like to, I'm sadly, I'm really sad to tell that we are a little bit late and we will have to close now. But first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I've been learning a lot. And there's a lot, I hope that you can do more connections and we can write papers 
and there's a lot of going on. Here, I wrote some text, took some notes. Uh, I would like to add that Samir, he's the, also developing pens also. He didn't mention, but he's also developing pens. You can chart, you can share your ideas, you can, you can discover how to measure the flow. Uh, I don't know, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert of that. Um, but thank you, it's been really, really fun and I'm super glad that we are here and thank you COVID-19 because we can have all together here on internet. Like we don't have to take a flight, right? We'd like to say some, some, say something at Mixon. Yes, yeah, Sergio. Uh, first, uh, I, I would like, uh, in the name of the University of São Paulo and the Institute of Astronomy, Geophysics and Atmospheric oh. Science to thank you all the speakers, the invited speakers. It was a great meeting. And uh, it was a great pleasure for us to, to have you all here. So thank you for your time, for your attention, and I hope we can do it uh, again soon. Sergio is already planning another one, so maybe we can talk more about, and maybe Sergio, we can use more time, you know, like dedicate more time for a better- Yeah, maybe we can do it in the second semester, so maybe. we expect more results from you. <laughs> you want, no, just yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, just one, just one question, Sergio. Where is the beer break now? Oh man, it depends <laughs> on the time because Robin now it's at seven a.m. If it's okay. the problem for beer, what of coffee? <laughs> uh, Chile, Chile, is, Chile is perfect for a beer. It's uh, six, uh, six p.m. <laughs> I've been drinking chimarron, so it depends. I would prefer wine, red wine for me. <laughs> okay, thank you. okay, everybody. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you. Oye, Alexandre. Right.